Good afternoon and welcome to Israeli News Live Steve and Yana show. We have a special guest today. We welcome John Moore in our studio. Welcome, John. Thank you, Yana. Good to be with you. I really appreciate you that you have agreed to have this interview with me for the sake of our friends, for the sake of listeners. And John, let's start off with uh, introducing you. Can you please take a few minutes and introduce okay. yourself, your background, your credentials? Okay, all right, real good. Well, as I frequently, frequently tell people, in 1967, the United States Military Intelligence School took my useless 19-year-old brain and made it something useful. They made it into a research tool. I graduated as an intelligence analyst from the U.S. Military Intelligence School in 1967. I was assigned to psychological warfare in Vietnam where I was an intelligence analyst. And uh, besides doing that work, I flew 57 combat missions while I was there and lived through the Tet Offensive of 1968. Came back to the States, was assigned to the Special Forces at Fort Bragg, the Green Berets, where I was trained, and we worked on uh, Middle East matters, and we prepared to invade the Middle East twice while I was there, 1969, 1970, uh, thank goodness we did not go. Left the Army, and I was trained once again, this time to become a paralegal. I began that career, and not long after I began that career, I was recruited by the state of Missouri to become a homicide detective. That was in 1975. Most of my adult life, I've been a homicide detective and investigator, uh, both civil and criminal matters, and um, started part-time in radio in 1995, 25 years ago, a part-time one-day-a-week show, and uh, for the past uh, 10 years or so, uh, 12, 14 years, I've been a full-time radio talk show host and public speaker. Uh, I found out about the matter involving Planet X in the spring of 2000. Uh, because of the work I've done in my adult life, I have friends in various uh, capacities that have access to classified information. After I found out about Planet X, I approached one of my friends uh, and asked him about this. He, he did not know. He says, John, I'll make some inquiries and find out about it and get back with you. So he made the inquiries. He got back with me a month later. He says, John, it's exactly what you said it is. The government's known about this since 1979. They've been preparing for it since 1979. Here's what happened, Yana. Uh, since about 1900, 1910, along in there, astronomers have known there's something really big in a certain part of space that was affecting our planets. When they went past a certain part of space, they were what's called perturbate. They would have a wobble. So they knew about where this object was, and they went looking for it in 1979 with the Pioneer 10 space probe, and they found it. It's called Planet X, and they've been tra tracking it ever since. And, pre and preparing for it ever since with the underground bases, moving uh, critical infrastructure, critical agencies from the coastlines to the middle of the country, and so forth. Uh, I wrote my paper, uh, went public with us in 2006. My paper, No Need for Panic, which was published in 2006 initially. And in that paper, I think it's the second or third page, Yana, I mentioned how at some point the government will want people to stay at home and wow. stay at home voluntarily. And in my paper I write, what better way to do that than to have a virus to get people to stay home? And I published this paper 14 years ago. And of course that's exactly what's happening right now. Uh, when the next lockdown comes, which I expect will be in September, October, uh, People will be told to stay home because it will be safe, and that's what they will do. You can count on it. People are scared to death, and they will stay home because they think it's a safe thing to do when it comes to the Chinese flu. Um, so that's where we are, Yana. Uh, I've been at this a long time. This is my 20th year of being aware of Planet X and the effects of Planet X, and it's been uh, quite a journey, to say the least learning the things I've learned, 
seeing the uh, missteps along the way, uh, seeing the things that have happened and have not happened, and watching the government all these years do things that don't make sense, such as moving CIA from Langley, Virginia to Denver, Colorado. The uh, initial press release said, we're doing this to break up the good old boy network that's been in place for so many decades. Well, that was so embarrassing that even their own people, even the own CIA people were laughing at that. Now the press release says, for operational reasons, moving from Langley, Virginia to Denver. National Security Agency at Fort Maine, Maryland. Uh, there's an interesting clip in uh, 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 a Hollywood film, Enemy of the State. Uh, excellent, well done movie, by the way. Mm -hmm. In that movie, they, they mention National Security Agency at Fort Meade, Maryland has 20 acres of Cray mainframe computers underground, which, of course, they did at one time. That's been moved to Utah. And uh, they have a cover story. Here's the cover story. We can't get enough electricity from the local power company to run our computers. Well, that doesn't make any sense because electricity is bought and sold back and forth uh, just like any other commodity. Of course, they could get the electricity, but they moved to Utah. Uh, another example, shortly after World War II, the government decided to build a very safe and secure place to study things like anthrax and foot and mouth disease and other things that are very dangerous to people and animals. And they bought an island. It's called Plum Island off the coast of New York, about uh, a couple hundred miles or so. Uh, maybe not that far, at least 100 miles. It's so about 300 acres. If you look at a Google uh, view from, 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 you know, aerial view, Google images, it looks like a 300 acre golf course with about five or six buildings on it. The, car, the public press release on that said, quote unquote, we've ran out of space on Plum Island, which of course is absurd. If you, all you gotta do is look at the aerial photographs, beautiful place by the way. And where did they move that? They moved it to Manhattan, Kansas. One of the worst places you could possibly imagine for something with the things as dangerous as what they've got in the middle of one of the most productive, valuable, agricultural places on the planet, Manhattan, Kansas. I think it's a good beginning point for our conversation, Yana. Yes, well, thank you, John. Some of the things you're saying, like, for example, that you wrote a paper that at one point government will want people to stay at home, and now I have seven other sources, all independent of each other, and they are saying that the second lockdown will be permanent that they don't want people out of that lockdown. So that's very interesting. And you know, John, I have to apologize to you because you have been saying this to my husband now for a very long time. And me as a skeptical extension of Steve, I was always skeptical and he wanted to move our family out and I would never want to move out of Florida. Florida was kind of like home. That's in my heart home, you know, I always loved right. it. and. Right. I just always kept telling him, well, I don't know, maybe, you know, would God really allow this and blah, blah, blah. And now that I have seven other sources, I started thinking and I'm like, wow, maybe I, sh maybe I should really apologize to you, John, and to my husband, because you were warning and now we are, you know, we have to move. So uh, thank you for all of that that you're doing. And you actually answered one of my questions. How long did government know of this? 1979. Well, I have another question. Why would government keep this secret from Americans? Before you, before well, John answers that, okay. one question I was curious about, John, was uh, just to get your take on this. Why is the government moving to different states? Why not just move everything to uh, Colorado Springs in, and instead of moving to three different states uh, in the Midwest? Well, uh, I can tell you why I believe, because I, I, they haven't shared with me why, but um, uh, it's, it's probably, uh, well, there's, there's, there's political reasons as well as, well as uh, tactical reasons. Um, there's a reason why every, uh, all the 50 states have military bases. That's to get the votes in Congress to spend the money. 
that may be some carry over there as to why there's in some other states besides Colorado to uh, uh, satisfy some political things that need to be satisfied. Um, and that's, that's basically a best guess. The, there are going to be two new capitals. Uh, the main capital will be Denver. The secondary capital will be Atlanta, Georgia, uh, because the country will be split in two at the Mississippi River Valley, which will be an inland sea. You don't build bridges across uh, a body of water that's 100 miles wide. You simply don't do that. Um, so the country will be split in two at the Mississippi River. Um, and what was your question, Jan, before we... Uh... Yes, why, why is... Uh... Well, government keeps it obviously a secret. Okay, okay, yeah, yeah. I understand. Yeah. Um, when I first recognized the true nature of this in, in the year 2000, uh, and I knew the government was not warning the people and, and was not going to warn them, I was very upset. And I, I remained that way upset uh, about that for quite a few years. And then in uh, this early in 2017, about January, so I was approached by the sponsor of the Prague Peace Prize, a retired uh, psychiatrist, and she asked me that question, and I had, to th I had to revisit that question and think about it in ways I had not thought about it before. And here's the answer. Uh, first of all, we have what in this country? 350 million people, I believe, give or take. Um, there's not now and it's not going to be. Even in 1979, there wasn't, and, and in 2020, there's not. There's not a place for 250, 350 million people to be safe. That place does not and will not exist. Therefore, here's the reasoning. If these people are going to die anyway, why tell them early and lead to uh, early death, early misery, when they can have... A, maybe two decades or more, maybe four decades, it's been 1979, sounds like 40 years ago to me. Um, they can have 40 years of peace and tranquility and living their lives instead of early death and early misery. That was a decision. As much as I don't like it, Yana, mm -hmm. I have no choice but to agree with it. Right. That that is, that's the, unfortunately, the humane thing to do, is to let people live their lives and have whatever happiness and enjoyment they can have if they're going to die anyway, as opposed to telling them 40 years early, which would have been a complete disaster, leading to countless millions of people dying uh, ahead of time that don't need to die ahead of time. It's a tough place to be, to have to make that kind of decision. But that's a decision that was made, and I can't find a way to disagree with it. Well, I guess, John, that right now we came to a place where the government had to come up with something to voluntarily make people voluntarily stay at home. Right. And that's right. what Corona virus is about. And um, that means that government knows that it's, the object must be very close and the event is about to happen within the near future, don't you think? Absolutely. Absolutely. The, the best policy is to get people to voluntarily comply. And with the virus, that's exactly what's happening. You know, I was out and about during the national lockdown that we went through this past spring, and it was scary going down interstate highways in the middle of the day during a weekday and seeing no vehicles. I looked in front of me, no vehicles. Looked behind me, no vehicles. On the interstate highways, they were typically... Uh, during normal workday, during the week, uh, be packed with automobiles and trucks. It was really scary, uh, but it worked. It was a practice run, basically. And the next lockdown will be um, permanent, as far as I can tell. Uh, uh, and wherever you are is where you're going to either live or die, is, is what will be coming at us, Yana. Well, you, John, you, you now, now you are like third person in the know that is telling me this. Um, okay, let me ask you this. Uh, what is the actual event? You say Planet X. It has many names. Um, some call it Wormwood, some call it Nibiru, um, and then uh, other names. But um, 
isn't it that it's preceded by some kind of an asteroid belt or right. Right. can you please tell us you mentioned some meeting you were in yesterday uh, what was that meeting about if you're willing to disclose well it, it was it was a wide-ranging meeting with uh, somebody connected to military intelligence and basically for me it was confirmation of things that I've known for years I don't need more confirmation but uh, that's what a lot of it was for me and and, and we went a lot of different directions in our discussion. But um, getting back to Planet X, um, there was a, uh, a man, a, a doctor, a, a astronomer, uh, Dr. Robert Harrington. Uh, at the time he was interviewed, uh, and the interview is available, um, I, I used to sell copies of it, but he was interviewed by uh, Zachariah Sitchin in the office of the United States Naval Observatory. What I tell people, Jan, is uh, once you've become the supervising astronomer of the United States Naval Observatory, you pretty much don't have any more upward mobility in that career path. You really don't. Where are you going to go from there? Maybe be a guest lecturer at Harvard or something. But um, he was interviewed by Zachariah Sitchin. Sitchin was a man who could pick up Babylonian clay tablets and read them like you and I could read the newspaper. Uh, in that interview, Dr. Harrington described the size, the density, and the orbit of Planet X. And he said that his findings, his professional findings, as the supervising astronomer of the United States Naval Observatory, basically paralleled what Zachariah Sitchin had found by studying the, uh, the Sumerian clay tablets. Uh, very similar. The orbit, the size, and so forth. Uh, Harrington made these statements uh, you know, in front of a, a video camera, and uh, that I've, I used, like I said, I used to sell that video. I haven't been selling copies for a while. But it's, an impor it's, a, it's only 10 minutes. It's a very important 10 minutes because of the credibility of, of Dr. Harrington. Uh, that's about as serious credentials as a human being can have when it comes to drawing a paycheck for looking at stars, being the supervising astronomer of the United States Naval Observatory. I will stand those credentials up against anybody, anywhere, anytime. Uh, people who say it's not true. Well, uh, what's your, I say, if, you're not, if it's not true, Show me your credentials compared to Dr. Robert Harrington, the supervising astronomer of the United States Naval Observatory. Um, and that was uh, in, the, in the early 1980s. I think it was about uh, 1983, uh, Jana, is when that interview took place. John, you know, John, <clears throat> let, me, let me ask real quick. John, can you, uh, because as many listeners as we have, almost 350,000 people, uh, or could you actually remake that available on your website? Because I am sure I'll have, I'll have to talk to the uh, producer who sells these, the distributor out in California. And um, uh, I know I'll be getting inquiries about this. It'll be thousands, uh, thousands. Can, can you yeah. please, please, John, at least privately send it to me if you have it, and then maybe I'll see. I may have. I, I can't. I don't know if I got a copy left here or not. But um, it, it's. It's kind of hokey in terms of the production with all these flashing graphics and dramatic music and, and all this silly stuff that uh, somebody talked uh, uh, Zachariah into put, putting in there. But uh, when it comes to the interview, it's, it's just uh, Dr. Harrington and Zachariah in, the, in Dr. Harrington's office there in Washington, D.C. Yeah. Very important. To, the rest of the video is interesting, but it's, those 10 minutes are the, what's really important. Right. Uh, and by the way, it was a one-hour interview. I've talked to the distributor of the video, and he, uh, Dr. Harrington died, I think it will be six or seven years ago this fall. Uh, I said Dr. Harrington. I meant uh, uh, Zachariah Sitchin. Zachariah Sitchin's uh, heirs are, have been fighting over who has the copy, who owns the copyright to his work, including that one-hour video. The um, Distributor tells me, John, we may never see the full hour interview uh, publicly, uh, which is unfortunate. The 10 minutes we do have access to is very critical, however, and I'll make that inquiry this afternoon to see uh, the availability of that video, and I'll, I'll let you know, Jan. If I have a copy, Jan, I'll, I'll mail it to you. I, I don't know. I haven't looked for that in quite a while.
Very kind of you, John. And I did read Zechariah Sitchin's work. There is various opinions on that. And I don't want to detour into this. However, um, I know that you are saying a very important information here. And I'm taking it to heart. And I urge listeners to take it to heart. But let's keep going on in, in our interview. Um, I know that there is this uh, website, deagle.com, which is a government military website, and it predicts a uh, population of the United States in 2025 being only 100 million. <laughs> we are talking about... Oh, 167 million, I believe. We're going to have no, a 200 was, million reduction. No, it was 100 million. It was 100 I million? Think, yes, okay. it's, uh, it's about reduction two-thirds of Americans. Do you think that they predicted this because their predictions are in, you know, they are doing predictions by AI in a quantum computers uh, based on something. Do you think that that prediction was made based on this coming event? Well, um, let's look at the word prediction. Uh, a prediction is uh, somebody saying something that they believe might happen. Uh, but uh, I can say, for example, Yana, the uh, sun's going to come up tomorrow morning over Florida. Is that a prediction? <laughs> yes. No, uh, that's not a prediction that's a fact, at all. Right? It's a fact. That's not a prediction at all. <laughs> and what Deagle is saying, I don't believe, is a prediction. They know what's coming. Oh, wow. If you know what's coming, if I know the sun's coming up tomorrow morning, that's not a prediction. If Deagle knows the population will be 100 million people, that's not a prediction. Um, and I go. I give you a, a real world example. Uh, one of my listeners sent me a link uh, in early. It was around May of uh, 2008, and um, they got a hold of a uh, notice that went out to all the uh, people who were investors at uh, the Royal Bank of Scotland, RBS, a bank which I believe this year. In about two or three years, they'll finish their third, their third century and start their fourth century of being a bank, the Royal Bank of Scotland. And uh, this was June of 2008. The warning they sent to the, their, their customers saying the following, and I'm, I went public with this the last, I had a Sunday show at the time, the last Sunday of June 2008, and it's archived. Ladies and gentlemen, sell all stocks and bonds before the end of September this year, September 2008, because it's soon to happen worldwide crash of the stock and bond market. Now, Royal Bank of Scotland was not making a prediction. They were saying what would happen because they knew what would happen. Deagle is not making a prediction. They're saying what's going to happen because they know what's going to happen. Deagle is a private think tank hired by Fortune 500 companies and the government to tell Fortune 500 companies and the government what will happen. Not predict what will happen, but what will happen. Hmm. <clears throat> Excuse me, John, in light of what you just said there, uh, it's kind of interesting because uh, Glenn, who uh, is advisor to the president, had shared with me that uh, it, uh, the scientists were actually thinking that 2010 was going to be the passing of uh, this this binary system. And uh, he said, but they were off. And so I have often gone back and looked at the events of preceding 2010, such as the the cl crash in 2008. Uh, the I think, what was it, the SAR, uh, SARS virus was out at that time. Some kind uh, of a virus. Everything that we have now with the coming crash, etc., seems to be in step. And he actually told me that what they had to do was re-artificially pump back up the economy once they realized that it was not, that they had gotten it wrong. Uh, he said the only difference is between now and then is that Miami is four inches underwater being pumped off artificially. So they realize now the system is very close, not to mention uh, the fact that when Obama was president and John Kerry goes to the South Pole, they were looking at it uh, from from that particular vantage point uh, that, yes, they do know now it's almost here. Well, that would be that would be a plausible explanation for John Kerry being in the Antarctic on Election Day 2016. Vladimir Putin being down there within the same time frame. The uh, 
pope and the head of the Eastern Orthodox Church being down there in about the same time frame. And we don't know how many others who aren't important enough to know when they travel someplace as opposed to those major uh, world leaders. Um, that would be a plausible explanation for them being there, wouldn't it, Steve? I think so, John. Yes. Well, and then also, you know, after, after the event, there is this danger of power-hungry New World Order uh, taking over, right? The, the well, the, what they want to do, and this is in my paper also, uh, no need for panic, uh, before the event, first of all, the event will shut down everything. Uh, there, there's not going to be an airline travel. Uh, ports will be destroyed. O ocean, you know, for loading and offloading uh, these ships and so forth. What they want to do, Yana, is have as much of their shiny new world order in place before they get shut down, shut down. Also, yes. So, so when they come out of wherever their their safe havens are, that they have something to uh, build on. Uh, the, the Chinese may be the best at this. They're, they're, the Chinese are colonizing sub-Saharan Africa. Um, they plan on colonizing the United States with no Americans and other parts of the world. The Chinese know in their hearts that the 21st century is their century. And they look at the uh, Planet X events as a bump in the road that they will overcome, feeling that they have enough hundreds of millions of people to have plenty of Chinese left over, no matter how many they lose, uh, to take over and run the world. Because the Chinese know that they're the most uh, handsome and beautiful, the most intelligent, the most athletic, the best people on the planet. You don't know what racism is to have been around ch <laughs> Chinese. You really don't. Yeah, that's right. Communism. I mean, seriously, you don't. It's true. Yeah. Um, it um, is, yeah. So, they're they're in a process of putting all the pieces in place. The Silk Road that comes out of the Hindu Kush goes all the way to Africa. The the branch that goes up through Europe, and um, that's their plan. And they're carrying out their plan to colonize Sub-Saharan Africa, to colonize the uh, United States, uh, probably much of South America. I don't know how much, but maybe all of it. And that's their plan, Yana. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I don't doubt it because I even I even see the work of New World Order right now, uh, taking our liberties and everything. But let, let, before you go okay. to your question, let me yeah. do a quick comment on that too, John. Uh, uh, Glenn from the White House had said that the the several places on the planet that would be relatively uh, unscathed, but not of course without dramatic changes, and it would be sub sub-Saharan Africa, as you mentioned. Uh, it would be uh, Eastern Israel, Syria, uh, that belt going across over into Iraq, and even Central China. They will also come out very well from uh, these events, and therefore they would be the next formidable force, which was confirmed by uh, one friend that I had with active uh, connections in the Mossad, uh, who said that China would be the next world superpower. Well, now we know why all these wars were happening, John, but anyway, uh, what I want to, let's go to the really um, map of the United States. Let's talk practical things now for the listeners. I know everybody has questions. We are not live, so I don't have live questions, but I do have some questions because I have warned um, people that I'm going to have you, well, warned, <laughs> I have informed people that I will have you on and they send me questions. But anyway, which areas of the United States are safe? First, because I'm a Floridian, please tell me about Florida as as the entire state. What is the predicted future for that state? Well, the highest elevation in Florida, I believe, is up in the Panhandle, somewhere in that area, 55 feet above sea level. Uh, let's back up a bit. Um, I was having lunch with a friend who is a veteran of the United States Navy Submarine Corps and Navy SEAL. Um, and uh, he told me about the classified briefing he was in, the U.S. Navy put on in 1985, where he saw the map, the map that's on my website, showing North America with new coastlines and an inland sea. You know, within four weeks, I had a, a pistol student, I teach concealed carry training, who as a retired officer from the U.S. Navy, and then only a few weeks after that, a retired intelligence officer who was also at the classified briefing. All three men worked with me to recreate the map that they were shown in these classified Navy briefings. That said, 
uh, Florida's finished. There will be no more Florida. It'll be completely gone. And let's see, the map is here at my website, at thelibertyman.com. Don't use your uh, search engine. Just put it right in your browser, thelibertyman.com. And you can see the map now. It's, it's, not, it's not supposed to be exact to the exact uh, foot or even the exact mile. It's a, uh, it's a map that shows, in general, where the water will be. Mm -hmm. So beginning at the Canadian border with Maine, you can see most of Maine is underwater. The East Coast takes damage typically 50 to 100 miles inland. Getting down to Virginia, uh, North Carolina, South Carolina, there's something called the Blue Ridge Parkway. And the water will come up right up to the Blue Ridge Parkway, which is typically 100 miles plus from the Atlantic Ocean. Mm -hmm. Getting down to Georgia, most of Georgia is gone. Uh, and we've got uh, uh, Alabama, uh, Mississippi, Louisiana, uh, most of them are underwater. Uh, Texas loses their coast up to about 100 miles from the Gulf of Mexico. The Inland Sea goes all the way up to Canada. Most of Illinois is underwater uh, and uh, parts of other states. The West Coast, uh, it gets pretty high pretty quick up to uh, about the middle of Oregon where the, uh, the, 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 we have some lower elevations. And, of course, the Cascade Mountains, which is a, another whole issue. The Cascade Mountains are not mountains. They're dormant or semi-dormant volcanoes. That's what the Cascade Mountains are. And we're already seeing signs of them coming to life. Mount Hood, for example, is showing signs of coming to life. Uh, the Inland Sea will split the country in two. Mm -hmm. A friend of mine, Command Sergeant Major Dan Page, who's been with me on my radio show a number of times, he was... Uh, when he was still in the Army, there was a briefing where the United States Northern Command uh, told all the senior uh, enlisted and the officers that they were going to split the United States Northern Command, U.S. NORTHCOM, east-west at the Mississippi River. All the men and women, all the equipment, all the supplies split east-west at the Mississippi River. They weren't told why. My friend Command Sergeant Major Page was sitting there smiling to himself because he knew why. What was why they were doing because they've got no choice it's easier to do it now and impossible to do it later mm -hmm. um so the map's on my website at the libertyman.com yana yes i'm actually looking at it uh, right now and you had this meeting yesterday did they mention before the system comes in did they mention asteroids before like uh, yeah well, well call them rocks call them asteroids call them meteor ships that uh uh, they're believed to be uh, starting to hit the Earth with um, uh, some regularity uh, beginning in September. And keeping in mind, meteors hit the planet 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Most of them are so small that they, they burn up before they even hit the ground. But these will be large enough to survive uh, coming through the atmosphere and cause damage when they hit. So possibly as early as September, uh, maybe uh, as late as November. Mm -hmm. So, and, and that will be all kind of Earth's changes, right, due to incoming system of all kinds of weather changes and uh, earthquakes. Well, eventually, eventually that would come. We've already seen part of it, and um, this is very important. Um, something that took place in June of 2010, June 12th, 2010. That's when the Gulf Stream stopped. Uh, it still go, comes up the East Coast, uh, goes east uh, about Cape Hatteras, North Carolina, towards the British Isles. It used to, up until June of 2010, go all the way across the North Atlantic to the British Isles, where it split. Some going north uh, towards the uh, Scandinavia, some going south towards France. That all ended June 12, 2010. Now, due to the uh, decreased salinity of the world's oceans, and, and the Atlantic Ocean, of course, which uh, caused the ocean to lose its ability to run that uh, Gulf Stream all the way across the ocean. Now, we interviewed myself and Dr. Deagle. Uh, we interviewed Dr. Luigi Anzangari uh, twice in July of 2010, and he confirmed that the Gulf Stream, in fact, he was the source of this information, he confirmed that the Gulf Stream did, in fact, stop on June 12, 2010. And, but he told, me, he told us something that neither one of us knew, and that's the fact that the Gulf Stream used to, past tense, 
regulate the jet stream. There's three jet streams. There's the northern hemisphere, there's the equatorial one, and the southern hemisphere. Our weather is basically a consequence of two things, Yana. Uh, what the jet stream does in in energy, I mean, not, yeah, what the jet stream does in energy from the sun. Uh, that's what determines most of our weather. And when the jet stream was being regulated, it caused it to, de to behave in a certain predictable manner that gave men and women in agriculture a, uh, something to count on in terms of dependable amounts of precipitation and dependable uh, temperatures. That's all gone. That's all gone. The, the people in agriculture can no longer depend on what they had depended on for so many centuries of certain amounts of rainfall and certain temperatures uh, at certain times of the year. That's all gone. That dependability is gone and the ability to engage in agriculture has been greatly compromised because of the uh, unpredictable nature of what our weather's become in the northern hemisphere. The northern hemisphere, of course, is where most agriculture takes place. That's where most of the people are. The southern hemisphere uh, has far less agriculture and far less people. Yes. Well, we have international audience, um, John. So I have a few questions from them. Canadians are asking, what do you think of Canada and safety there? We have a lot of Europeans. I'll ask about Europe because I have a lot of family in Europe, uh, Eastern Europe. Uh, so what do you think of these areas? Well, um, the pole shift is predictable because it's happened many times. Uh, well, here's what happens. First of all, there's two north poles. There's magnetic north where the compass points, right. and there's true north where the, where the planet revolves. You know, true north has been in, in many different places over the, over the millennium. Uh, well, here's what happens. Uh, when the pole shift happens, true north and magnetic north are in the exact same spot. Within three days, magnetic north starts moving, and after about 3,600 years, it gets to where the new north pole is going to be. And over a period of maybe 72 hours or so, uh, magnetic north and true north line up again. Well, magnetic north is way over in, north, in Russia right now, so that's where the new north pole is going to be, which means Canada is going to get warmer and Europe is going to get colder. Uh, that's just an unfortunate fact of life. So, uh, Canada will be farther away from the North Pole, and Europe will be closer to the North Pole. Do you have a world map as far as um, how uh, how uh, continents will shift and which countries in Europe will survive? And do well, I, I don't. But here's what people can do: uh, Google Earth uh, has a uh, way to determine. Uh, what areas will be flooded given any uh, out, out, uh, any place on the planet. You can uh, ask Google Earth what will it look like if the water raises 50 feet, for example, and it'll show you what will be flooded. What will it look like if the water comes up 100 feet, and it will show you. So people can do that on their own and find out themselves. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, fair enough. Um, so let's go. Steve has a question. I do have a go question, ahead. John. When you were uh, speaking with uh, uh, your source that you have that was confirming this information for you, has there been any, any indication where we could uh, most likely see one of the first impacts uh, as far as the end of this year? Has anybody indicated anything like that as of yet on your side? Not, not to me. No, I didn't. I didn't hear that yet. Uh, I'm meeting with another source soon. I hope that may have that information, but I, I don't know it for a fact that he will. Okay. Thank you, John. John, as um, as far as advice to our listeners, any practical advice that you have for people in general, as much as you can think about, think of as many tips as you can think of. Well. First of all, the government's not going to take care of you. Uh, second of all, you're going to be on your own, you and your family. Um, there's several parts this. One is going to be having a location that's at least 600 feet above sea level, a place that ideally is some distance from major population centers, a place that has 
uh, a proprietary source of water that's drinkable, a place where food can be grown, um, and ideally a neighborhood of people that are somewhat independent in terms of uh, knowing about agriculture, being able to grow food, uh, look out for each other, and take care of each other. Communities will take Communities will stand together or communities will fail together. That's what will happen. Uh, if you think you can take your wife and children go off in the woods and survive uh, without community, you're wrong. That's not going to work. Uh, communities need to come together to take care of each other. That's what will work. Right. Yes. Are you willing to come for a Q&A session with some of the listeners in near future? You mean uh, like a, come come physically to some place? No, <laughs> well, I wish, oh. John. I wish we could oh. do that again. <laughs> I don't think oh, that's sure. I don't think that's possible. What I'm saying, uh, live live program, maybe on Zoom or maybe well, oh, even, sure. even even on our YouTube, we would just have, we get it so fast, we'd have to just take the ones that we can see uh, questions right. like that. Right. Uh, John, one thing though, before we get too close to the end. Uh, I would like for the listeners to know you started a new thing on Tuesday on your uh, live broadcast. Could you tell the listeners a little bit about that? Okay, well, my live show is on Republic Broadcasting Monday through Friday, 8 to 10 a.m. Central Time. And what we today was the second day of doing a, a roundtable with myself, you, Steve Ben Noon, uh, my friend Steve O'Neill is a nuclear engineer, and my friend Leon Green, who's a former officer in the United States Navy, very uh, great panel of, of men who have a tremendous, the, the knowledge between the four of us is just spectacular. And of course, we t it's a live call-in show, and we take calls from the uh, questions from the listeners. Uh, it's been well received, uh, it has a very positive response from everybody. Uh, so today was the second day, and we're going to continue doing this as long as it makes sense to do so, Steve. Sounds great. So we'll post a link for you guys on how you can get to Republican Broadcast to listen to that and all, of course, the other shows that John does throughout the week. I'm sure it'll be a blessing. Continue on, guys. Well, uh, we are almost at the end here, uh, friends, So, but I, I, I think I have one more question. I know that communications will be down, uh, no doubt. So... After the event, how do we communicate with our Western friends, between Eastern and Western friends now? Do you think ham radios or anything like that that we can... Well, well, ham, well ham radio will work, what they call HF, high frequency. Um, uh, high frequency radio can talk any place on the planet, assuming both parties have the equipment and the knowledge. Uh, so that will be the way to communicate, yes. Okay, so maybe we should start preparing for that, so we know what's well, happening. Well, it's, it's, the, the time is late, but it can still be done. Yes, absolutely. I know. Okay, well, John, oops, sorry, my microphone fell. Uh, at this point, um, I just want to thank you for everything you're doing and for coming on to program with me and um, wish you all the best. And... Um, stay in prayer because i believe that uh, we have contacts to the most high creator who can help us through all of this but also form communities and like-minded friends um, steve do you have any closing words well the thing is is people need to stay informed and john moore is an excellent source for this he's been in the know uh, and has publicly been in the know and putting this information out probably longer than anyone has. And, uh, you know, so check out his website. Look at the information John has to offer there uh, as well. Uh, there's products that John offers on his website. I know it will be a blessing to many of you. Uh, and, uh, and, and that's the way that John's uh, broadcast is supported is for those that, uh, that, that look at the products that are valuable things that are needed uh, so definitely check out uh, john's website libertyman.com uh, is that right john yeah libertyman the libertyman.com you the. put it right in your browser if you use a search engine you'll be at 20 different places you don't want to be just put it right in your browser the libertyman.com 
Very good. Thank you so much, John. Please stay on with okay, me guys. after the okay. end. Can you stay on a little bit longer? Uh, 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 okay. Sure. Yeah, course. sure. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you for listening and you have a great uh, afternoon. Thank you guys.